Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I wanna talk about Nick Sleep's Nomad Partnership Letters from the year 2002. Every year that Sleep's Fund was open, he wrote an interim letter, which is basically a half year letter, and then he would end up the year with his annual letter for his investors. And 2002 is where things really start to get interesting for Nick Sleep. We cover a few of the investments that are covered in William Green's book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. One of those being Stagecoach. And we also get a first look at Nick Sleep's thinking about Costco. Nick Sleep also covers his investment thesis for Xerox. And most importantly, he actually covers one of his big mistakes, which was investing in Monsanto. Please let me know in the comments below if you've read the 2002 Nick Sleep letters and what your key takeaways were from them. So let's hop back to 2002 and see what kind of investing lessons we can learn from Nick Sleep. Sleep includes the annual returns for the partnerships at the beginning of each of the interim and the annual letters. But at this point in time, the fund had barely been open for more than a year, so he doesn't want to give too much credence to the performance of the fund so far. But he does have a very interesting philosophy about the fund, which is basically a lesson we can learn from Warren Buffett as well. In fact, he quotes Warren Buffett at the beginning of this letter. And this is sort of a lesson for investors that we can think about our returns over the long haul. He quotes Buffett from his early partnership letters back in 1960. He quotes, I have pointed out that any superior record which we might accomplish should not be expected to be evidenced by a relatively constant advantage in performance compared to the average. Rather, it is likely that if such an advantage is achieved, it will be through better than average performance in stable or declining markets and average or perhaps even poorer than average performance in rising markets. So back in the 60s, Buffett realized that the returns for his partnerships were not gonna be linear. So we're not just gonna go up in a straight line and you know everything's gonna be hunky-dory. So in times that the market is doing really well, it was very likely that Buffett would either match the market or underperform the market. But in the times of where the market was in a downturn, Buffett trounced the market. So it looks like Sleep subscribes to the same philosophy where he expects to really outperform any relevant benchmark and earn his absolute return that he's aiming for, especially when the markets are in a downturn. And really, if you think about it, that's when value investing kicks into high gear for us. Returns come when we can purchase into great businesses when we're at maximum pessimism or when the prices of mediocre businesses drop really low to you know, half of their intrinsic value. So this philosophy to me makes a lot of sense. There's also another wonderful quote that Sleep references from the book, Where Are All the Customers Yachts? He quotes the author as saying, when there is a stock market boom and everyone is scrambling for common stocks, take all of your common stocks and sell them. Take the proceeds and buy conservative bonds. No doubt the stocks you sold will go higher. Pay no attention to this. Just wait for the depression, which will come sooner or later. When this depression or panic becomes a national catastrophe, sell out of the bonds and buy back the stocks. No doubt the stocks will go lower still. Again, pay no attention. Wait for the next boom. Continue to repeat this operation as long as you live and you'll have the pleasure of dying rich. Sleep says here that the operative phrase is pay no attention. This goes back to Sleep's reference to Buffett's quote, where when the market is at its period of maximum pessimism, that's the time to act and we need to act heavily. And if you do that over the course of your life, then there's really no chance that you won't become wealthy. Sleep points out that pay no attention is the most important part of this quote. And Really, pay, to me, the pay no attention is sort of trying to prevent yourself from being a short-term investor. If you see stocks continue to go down after you buy them or stocks continue to go up after you sell them, don't worry. There will always be another investment opportunity. If we're able to manage our short-term psychology and avoid any of these meteoric bubbles, say in assets like Dogecoin, or if we can prevent ourselves from panicking and selling when we know we own great businesses and we see them go down, then the investment track record is probably gonna take care of itself. But of course, these psychological checks that we need to keep on ourselves is probably the hardest part about investing. So good luck with that. Author William Green writes about this more in depth in the book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, where sleep is basically shuts out the rest of the world, only focuses on his own research and 
you know, it, it's only matters of what he thinks about something. We'll definitely be on the right path if we can just block out the noise and focus on the work at hand. Sleep relates this to the excellent company Estee Lauder, which he claims that he would own if it were selling at a more reasonable price. But basically the company had announced that earnings would decline so that they could invest back into their brand. So actions like these really focus on the long term. And of course it's gonna raise revenue for the long term, but the market reacted negatively to this because they announced that they were gonna miss their earnings. So the shares went down 15%. So as investors, we need to pay no attention to this decrease or rather maybe pay attention to it as a buying opportunity into a wonderful company. I wanna read this quote. Sleep says, in effect, the company has been punished by the markets for being sensible. It is this behavior that gets us excited and sets up investment opportunities. Next, Sleep begins to discuss his investment in Xerox, which is a copier and printer manufacturer. So Xerox had about 70% of the market share for these high-end printers, and it was a pretty profitable business, but it wasn't a very high growth business. So of course, Xerox uh, fell prey to sort of trying to manipulate their growth a little bit. Sleep guesses that because Wall Street rewards earnings growth above any other metric, management was willing to sort of reach for this 15% growth mark, even though their revenues were only growing 5% a year. So in order to continue to grow their earnings at 15% per year, they resorted to a little bit of accounting shenanigans. Sleep goes into depth about the accounting shenanigans and even gives a little bit of a textbook example of lease and sale accounting. So as Sleep says, if the topic bores you, please skip to the next paragraph. And in this video, I'm not gonna cover it in too much depth, so definitely go check out this uh, ex explanation of the lease and sales accounting on page 10 and 11. But the gist of it is that through sale type accounting, Xerox was able to basically book the revenues and profits upfront from any leasing contracts that they signed. So this is a perfectly good example of management responding to incentives. And in this case, they responded by using an accounting method that recognized profits before they were actually earned. So if Wall Street wants you to grow your earnings today, then you're gonna do what you can with the accounting to recognize earnings today. So eventually the SEC investigated the firm's accounting and the share prices declined 7% from their all-time high. So of course the market's gonna react neg negatively to any story of accounting manipulation, but Sleep wants us to put this into perspective. He says, in the five years to 2001, cumulative revenues at Xerox approached $90 billion, of which 6.4 billion was incorrectly booked. Cash flow and free cash flow, the basis of our valuation of the firm is completely unaffected. Customers were still paying their bills and any programs that were implemented to artificially raise the earnings growth rate were being reversed. And Xerox on top of that were starting to pay off their debt. This is kind of a funny point. The auditors and accountants were eventually replaced for Xerox. And then those replaced auditors were saying that Xerox's revenues were actually understated. But again, when valuing the business, it didn't matter because the cash flow didn't change. Then Sleep gives a pretty good explanation for his valuation for the business. He says that the free cash flow for the firm was about 1 billion, so they could pay off their debt in two years. And in addition, the market cap was only 4.5 billion. So that was four and a half times free cash flow for this business. At the time, Xerox was trading for $6 per share and they thought it would be potentially worth $14 per share. This is a pretty good example of taking advantage of oddities within the market where a company is using some accounting shenanigans that actually isn't affecting their free cash flow, which is the basis that we want to generally value companies on. But yeah, if you wanna learn more about Xerox, definitely dive into this letter. Sleep ends the letter talking about one of his mistakes, or as he calls it, his analytical error. And I think this is really important. Warren Buffett does this in his Berkshire Hathaway annual letters, and talking about mistakes is totally underrated. We probably won't grow as investors if we're dishonest with ourselves and ignore or hide our past mistakes. So according to Sleep, Monsanto is a manufacturer of genetically modified seeds and fertilizers, and he says that it's a good business with a good economics, good growth potential, and good management at a low share price. So Sleep thought he made a mistake with Monsanto because of something that he actually missed during his initial analysis of Monsanto. But basically there was this spin-off to Monsanto, and then this entity actually had potential liabilities for any environmental cleanups. So this entity, which was called Salutia, had a lot of healthcare liabilities and debt on their balance sheet, 
Um, and if they were unable to pay those, then that would go back up to the parent company, which was called Pharmacia. But the kicker here is that Monsanto had indemnified Pharmacia for any environmental or punitive damages incurred as a result of Salutia's operations. So Sleep missed this initially, and he only saw it later on when he was reading a more recent document, and it was buried in the footnotes. So on that basis, because Sleep had no way of knowing what, what potential damages uh, Monsanto might be on the hook for, he didn't feel comfortable valuing the company at all. He said that the prudent thing to do was to sell our shares for approximately the price we had paid. So you could do two things in this situation. One would be to try to familiarize yourself with these indemnities and you know, be, try to become an expert on these environmental cleanup costs that might be coming in the future. Or you can simply sell your shares because the investment thesis had changed. So Sleep went with that second option and if you ask yourself what would Warren Buffett do, I think that's exactly what Buffett would have done as well. When the thesis has changed, you have to change your mind about the investment. And probably even if that comes at a loss or a small loss, it's a lot better to dispose of something that you cannot really properly value and you don't understand as well as you think you did. So that was a brief summary of Sleep's interim letter for the year 2002. Okay, next we can take a look at the year end report for 2002. And I think the two most important parts for this particular letter in 2002 were the lessons we can take away from the investment in Stagecoach and Nick Sleep's thoughts about Costco. So if you have read Richer, Wiser, Happier, then you may be familiar with the Stagecoach investment. But basically, Stagecoach is the largest bus operator in the UK. The UK bus system was nationally owned for several years, but eventually it became deregulated, and these assets were auctioned off to private companies like Stagecoach. The CEO of Stagecoach, his name is Brian Souter, was a really good manager. Souter's model was to do the simple things right. So that included things such as making sure that buses showed up on time and on schedule, uh, giving privilege to the passengers instead of the drivers or the conductors, and also collecting fares on time, putting more buses during rush hour, and things of that nature. Most importantly, Souter wanted to continue to undercut the remaining state-owned competition and basically wipe them out of business. So at this point, the private sector prevailed, and the operating numbers and passenger numbers continued to grow for Stagecoach. And of course, they wanted to continue to grow with this recipe, so they started to export this operation overseas. They had a presence in Scandinavia, Hong Kong, and even parts of Africa. And this is pretty astounding. Within 10 years of listing, their revenues and profits grew tenfold. So when the company first was listed back in 1993, each share was selling for 20 pence. and at this time in 1998, the share price reached two pounds and 85. So Souter had obviously hit the ball out of the park running Stagecoach. Uh, he ended up going into a retirement and handed the day-to-day -day operations over to the next group. But the only thing he wanted to make sure of was that they maintained the dividend that he had put in place for the company. But basically, as soon as Souter went into retirement, then problems started here for Stagecoach. Their operations had been so successful and they wanted to continue that growth, but they started to find that growth in places that they probably shouldn't have been looking in the first place. For an example, they purchased a minority stake in a Chinese toll road operator. They took control of train leasing businesses and basically sold that as soon as they bought it, which was kind of a pointless purchase. They purchased a bus operator in the United States called Coach. Sleep describes their purchase of Coach USA as a hubristic top of the cycle purchase. Coach was made up of a bunch of different bus and taxi operations, and they were all paid for with debt. Sleep estimated that all these businesses on their own weren't very good, uh, and they simply paid way too much for these businesses. I wrote in the margins here that they were trying to fix a bad business, which had a high CapEx investment. So not only did Coach require heavy investment, but they also needed to revamp the fleet in the UK, their original operations. So Stagecoach had made this mistake where they were trying to export one business model that worked really well in places like the UK to a totally different environment in the United States. Sleep says it's not hard to run a profitable bus company, but you do need to keep the plates spinning, AKA do the simple things right, claims the former executive Souter. And then management had stopped spinning plates. So shares had plummeted to pre-IPO prices of 10 pence per share 
in 2002. The final straw that broke the camel's back was when the current management team cut the dividend and Souter was forced to come back out of retirement to basically save the company. So Souter came back and basically started to perform surgery on the business. There's a great quote in here um, that Sleep says that Charlie Munger refers to this as the cancer surgery approach. Basically, what he's getting at is there's a wonderful operating business within this company, but there's a bunch of extraneous businesses that have nothing to do with the core businesses that are really dragging down earnings. Munger saw this in Coca-Cola, where Coca-Cola was owning shrimp factories, wineries, film studios, and all of this stuff was taken away from the core business of syrup and fizzy water. And when I was reading through this, it made me think a little bit of Naspers and Prosis. So the, the crown jewel at the core of their businesses is their investment in Tencent. And really they're using all the profits and proceeds from Tencent to fund other ventures and other businesses. Now it remains to be seen whether or not that's being dilutive. Uh, I mean, so far it has been, but it is possible that they might find the next Tencent. So those two are sort of operating like venture firms. So this cancer surgery approach is one way to look at valuing businesses. However, I think it's a little more difficult because I think it requires some activist investor behavior or uh, a new really responsive management team to, to come into place. So basically applying this new cancer surgery approach, Stagecoach was able to start to repay its debts, uh, shed its worst performing assets such as the US operations and really go back and focus on their core business operations in the UK. So Stagecoach was well on its way to doing this sort of turnaround and uh, Sleep thought that the company was worth at least 60p per share and his purchase price was 14p and the current market price at the time was 33. So there was still at least a double left, he thought. On top of that, the dividend had been reinstated. One interesting thing to note is this opportunity was so attractive to Sleep that they had made it their largest investment. Next, Sleep goes on to describe the business model for Costco. It's part of a warehouse duopoly with Sam's Club, which is Walmart's alternative to Costco. The business model for Costco is relatively simple. Basically, customers will pay an annual fee to get access to the store for the year and Costco provides them with the promise of everyday low pricing, where they will guarantee that their customers will never find items marked up more than 14% or 15% above wholesale. So basically Costco is buying the loyalty of these customers through the annual membership fee, and they're in return giving this promise that they will always provide the lowest prices possible, just enough to cover their operations. Sleep is well known for the term scaled economies shared, and he doesn't call it this exactly in, in this letter here, but he says, in addition, by sticking to a standard markup, savings achieved through purchasing or scale are returned to the customers in the form of lower prices, which in turn encourages growth and extends scale advantages. I have a video on Nick Sleep where I discuss this concept a little more in depth over here if you wanna check that out. But basically Costco is involved in this virtuous cycle where they pass on all of their savings back to the customers and then are able to acquire more goods for cheaper prices and then they continue to pass on those savings to the customers. Behavior like that really instills loyalty into your consumer base. You may have heard this story already, but I would call it the jeans story for Costco. This sort of illustrates how important the everyday low pricing idea is to Costco uh, management. Basically Costco bought 2 million pairs of jeans and the price per jean was about $22. They had sold these in the past for about $10, so that could be a potential markup of over 50%. On top of that, that would still be close to half of the cost that other retailers were selling these jeans for. There was a buyer for these jeans who suggested that they mark up more than the usual 14 or 15% to increase their margins, and Jim Senegal was not buying it. He says, if I let you do it this time, you will do it again. The contract with the customer, which means very low prices, must not be broken. It is a sacred bond between Costco and the customers. Customers have to know that every time they go to Costco, they will be getting the best price. So Costco is not going to forsake that trust just for a little bit of extra margin on some jeans. This strategy is super important because it really increases the lifetime value of each customer and each shopper at Costco. Sleep also goes on to explore the follies of employing high low price strategies where you might see you know, $2 for a case of 24 water bottles and those are called loss leaders. Um, 
but at the same time, you might see those same water bottles selling for $10 the next week. So what are those water bottles really worth to your customers? Costco is really straightforward. You know you're gonna get 14% markup on those water bottles. So basically, Sleep puts the Costco business into an easy to understand and hard to operate category. And it's a really wonderful business to study if you really want to understand the retail business in general. So business like this, where we know where Costco is right now, it was selling for half price of what Nick Sleep thought the intrinsic value was. And Costco is one of those businesses that Sleep held on to for basically the entirety of his fund. So Costco turned out to be a wonderful investment. And of course, it's a wonderful business that's still very powerful today. It looks like this is one of those first businesses that Sleep is starting to realize that, hey, if I find a great business and it doesn't seem to be egregiously overvalued and it seems to be growing as well, then maybe I should just hold on to this thing. So I'm looking forward to see if his thinking on Costco evolves throughout these letters. If you wanna learn more about Nick Sleep, I have a playlist over here where I cover Nick Sleep's shareholder letters by year. And I also have a video over here where I discuss Nick Sleep's chapter in the book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with the videos I release about the Nomad Partnership investment letters. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you watching this all the way to the end and I will see you in the next video.